Uh, my name is Andrew Lutt, and Project Ranger is something that uh, the cauldron three years ago we were sitting around talking about ranges and how it should be relatively easy to pick up more contextual range information than in an easy fashion that we currently do. Uh, that spawned spending some time looking into it, and after lots of over engineering, three, three years later, this is what we end up with. Uh, a lot of it was actually done, done last year, over the last year, you know, sort of tweaking to find ways to make it better. Um, so these are the original goals of the project. We decided that um, currently in UCC, you can get a range, but it's only two endpoints or it's an anti range. Which we discussed. You can do a not zero or something. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but this apparently does what I want to talk about. Um, we wanted it. There have been requests for uh, people who want floating point ranges, which we currently only support integer ranges, so we wanted to make extensibles, other kinds of ranges. Um, if you want ranges today, you have to either take just a global range or you have to wire into one of the other passes in BRP, which calculates um, more contextually sensitive ranges, um, which is the heavy weight infrastructure. So we agree there's got to be a way of doing that. And the other thing that I wanted to do was um, just sort of teach the compiler, this is what a range is and how it works, and then let it go. And instead of looking for specific cases, let it find the cases. Um, I just let it go wild and see what it does. So uh, yeah. one of the motivating cases we were looking at when we first started looking at this was we wanted to prove out of bounds array index forms. Um, and the problem we had was you see again you get global ranges. So once you have a merge point where you feed, um, the resultant range there is the union of all the ranges that come into that feed. And that makes it exceedingly difficult to get a very good accurate uh, limit on the bounds of arrays. And that's really what started us down this path. We, we think it has a lot more uses, but that, that is what got us started, was the desire to get much more accurate uh, diagnostics on mm -hmm. certain passes. Yeah, I didn't go into a whole lot of background on this, but basically, I mean, when you see if A is less than 10, on the true side, you know the range of A is whatever the minimum of the type is denied, and if you're taking false edge, you know everything, you know it's 10 to whatever the maximum of the range is for that entire domain subject. And in the case of like a switch or something, uh, each switch, uh, there's all kinds of things. You, could, you should be able to know exactly what the range is for inside the case. If you ask what the, something about it, you should be able to know where it is. And we didn't really have that. Deal. So we started off with the accurate range part. Uh, we created a new, a new range class that uh, basically just consists of an arbitrary number of subranges. You're not limited to just a pair of rings. But there are like really two endpoints that we had before. Um, GCC complicates things right now because it's symbolic, symbolic names inside its ranges. So it can have a range that's from zero to X plus five. And that makes it more complicated to union that with another range or combine it. Or it just uh, it, it makes the code far more complicated. And so we want to go with the simple. And do all kinds of technical operations on things, check for and that sort of thing. The, uh, the extensible part where we want to be able to handle other types as well. Uh, the current the current implementation, um, we just arbitrarily chose three sub ranges because it gives us more than we currently have, and we might see if that would do anything interesting. <laughs> Extendables and handle floats. We talked about even hacking it up would be probably with implement that we probably can support some basic float operation. Well, vector types would be probably even more interesting than floating. Yeah. I mean, where there's all kinds of interesting things you might be able to do. That's one of the things I hope to get into this at the end is your guys' input on what kinds of things are interesting to explore. Yeah, yeah we hadn't even thought about vector types, so it's definitely worth exploring. There are many, many use cases where you are interested. Either in the union of all the ranges for the vector or in the individual elements. 
Are you guys talking about just limited inside the compiler? Yeah. Okay. I mean, the use cases I want this for is ranges exporting the range data out of the compiler. Because, like, so in the VHDL world, when, when I used to do validation, one of the big things was that the VHDL and HDL compilers gave you range data. And then from the range data, you computed all the test cases you need to get coverage. And so what I want... So you mean like global ranges? Yeah, like okay. from, well, from, that's a, not from a glibc side, from the application side, what I want to say is like this this part of the loader, I want to know, tell the ranger tell me like where what's all the ranges for the thing so that I can write either unit tests yeah. or auto-generate unit tests to then test all that code before it goes out. So having accurate range information would be cool for that. But I don't yeah, the, but you got to map it back to a specific object in the source, right? Yeah. And that's so where we're going to this problem where you, yeah. you you have to union all those ranges. It might be, yeah. It sounds like moral engineering. <laughs> yeah, I, I, so, I don't know. Well, no, I mean, we could query, we could go back to the global range table and query that and export that. That's yeah. not hard. I mean, that, that information's available now, which is whether it's uh, how accurate it is. It's yeah, that's the accuracy is what I'm concerned about. But it doesn't, I mean, it's not a huge issue because if it's inaccurate, all you're doing is doing a little more testing than you should, right? Hmm. Or a little less testing than you should because it's better testing than we have, better knowledge than we have today about, like, what data do I have to feed into these these APIs? Like I can cut it up by API. Yeah. Like so, for some cases, I can take something and cut it up. But then I need something to tell me what is the range of the data that I should be feeding to get proper coverage. And the uh, the other thing that we thought would be very useful, being extensible, is being able to um, adjust or dynamically adjust the number of subranges. So most of the time, we only care about two or three. But if you want to do switch analysis, maybe the switch analysis create a ranger that has an arbitrary number of ranges so you can really do really detailed analysis of the switch cases and optimize the switch. So if there's, you have you might have 15 different sub ranges. Uh, we don't want it to have it over the rest of the compiler, but maybe we'll both invoke that for our switch analysis. Have you uh, guys one of the things with ranges that I uh, that I think is kind of relevant with what Carlos was saying is uh, being able to Lines that from the uh, uh, from the dumps. Mm -hmm. um, I've been thinking about maybe enhancing the dump machinery to uh, annotate expressions or blocks, yeah. whatever, um, with the ranges of variables. Any have you worked out anything like that? So we in in the ranger itself. So we wrote a VRP pass that, you, that it uses the ranger, and it does a dump that does a lot of contextual range information. That's how we debug. Basically, every base block tells you what ranges are coming in, what ranges are going out, and um, can give you some contextual stuff in each block. Right, VRB uh, does that also. What I was talking yeah. about is um, it directly in the code. Yeah. So, uh, code with so one, of, one of the things that I would like to do is promote ranges from this value range thing that we currently have um, into being more of a, a first class type citizen so that it really is a type just like in code. To the compiler, so it's just another kind of tree, and then the dumps would be able to. Uh, you'd be able to well, the there is current can dump um, with minus alias uh, the the SSA name range. Right. Which so, is the the so the the problem is with a lot of cases like contextual stuff, um, you have to have an active ranger going in order to. So you could you could have a dump that invokes a ranger and asks as it's dumping what's the ranger for, and if it's something interesting. But the question is then, where do you dump it? Because for the global range, we dump it at the definition points. Right. So yeah. contextually, we have to do the live on. Otherwise, you would. Um, but the, you, you could write a dumper for sure, and then invokes a ranger. I mean, that, that's basically what my pass does. Um, it invokes, we invoke the ranger, and then do a dump with CFGs. But all you would do is integrate that into more tightly into the layers. We could. Have you seen the global, what Jakob just said, the global, the global range for a variable? It's minus that dump alias, which is inappropriately named, but it'll, it'll give well, you because a Well, because for, for a pointer, it's the same, uh, same pointer on the SSA name as has the alias information. Right. Okay. So, uh, it's like it's, that's where it's all <laughs> shoved. Okay. It's got to come from that read. We don't consider the global range information that interesting. No. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's the whole point of this, is to give us some contextual stuff. Um, so the next thing we cared about was that it was easy to use. The entire API is there's five routines. Uh, 
um, range of expression, you can ask for the range of an SSA, and you want a statement it will tell you what the range is coming into that statement. Um, the ranger has all of the smarts to go off and find the information for you. You don't have to build any infrastructure. You just and you just, you just ask for information and it figures out what for you. So, so is it before the statement mentioned there? So that is yes, before the statement is executed. Range of statement tells you what the result of the statement is. Um, the range on edge, you can ask for what an SSA name the range on edge is on entry to a block or on exit to a block. So on exit to a block would be before, just before the branch. <coughs> so one of the things all that replaces is the assert expert craziness that we have in the old BRP propagation test. We can get all that data that lives in assert experts, but we can get it outside of the BRP pass. Yeah, without, without, without building any infrastructure, that's where it is. Uh, which brings us to the next thing of avoiding these heavy infrastructures. Right now, you, you get global information, or if you want contextual information, you either have to put your pass in the middle of BRP, which has been done a bunch of times, or you take the existing eBRP, which does a dominator based block. And you, and you can get the information, but you have to wire into a dominator block and block the entire output. Um, this is designed uh, to start. At with the location of your request and walk to use that chains back and, and look for back to the death point and satisfy anything coming in, any requests. Like it, it goes out and figures it all out for you. Um, it's a solver. Yeah, it's and and so when it goes back to when it goes back to a statement, if there's a range, it will query itself for a range of that statement until it resolves until it resolves the answer. So it's effectively not, so there's no startup cost. If you create a ranger, and if you don't, if you don't ask for anything, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, if you ask for uh, just one or two pieces of information, it will, it will just do just enough work to satisfy the answer uh, and nothing else. As opposed to the current system, which walks an entire IL, calculates ranges, and so it doesn't know what you ask. So it's on demand. That, that's, that, that's the key that you're trying to get. Right, right now, EBRP, literally has to analyze the entire IL, even if you only care about ranges for three objects, it's going to analyze the entire uh, And I have, I have a slide later where I, where I show we converted a few passes and it gives you the idea of how, how useful that can be. For, for the caching, do you actually uh, dump the cache at the end of each pass or does it survive? Uh, no, passes? so I have considered trying to keep it alive we have to be able to monitor changes to the CFG when that happens. If the CFG doesn't change, then it should be okay. But right now, uh, we just do it on demand. And, and, throw it away. and is there some way to invalidate it on some way when you move an SSA? Well, right now it's validated somewhere. as soon as you're done. Like you just create a new one, right? Okay. It's fast enough that it's, it's pretty fast most care. of the time, you don't have to worry about it. Um, and if, I mean, it's something we considered, but we haven't seen the necessity for it yet. But I, I, have, I have gone through the exercise of figuring out, and it's, it's less error prone at the moment. Just because for the global range, I think we have invalidates the same name. Yeah, we've got something. something. Yeah. Well, in, in some cases, when you move something around, well, from the or to the yeah. <laughs> yeah, but for example, currently uh, the early value range propagation produces results that are then uh, propagated also into the CD rules. So in the case, it takes this from the SSA name, so that's all it does. If you calculate it, it's already calculated. Yeah, that's just the global range, though, right? Right, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, so, so the, um, yeah, I mean, there's there's probably room in there for the IPA pass to invoke a ranger and that stuff, too. Yeah, that, that's the alternative. Yeah, Surely, well, because you have a call and you can ask. Sure, sure, sure. You yeah, haven't gotten as far as experimenting with that. Yet, so. Yeah, one of the things we, we've always talked about is, and I suspect we get a little bit into this, was not to tune how much work it does. And so, for for example, in the IPA or the early passes, we may want to turn that off and say, you know, don't do everything. You know, how 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 far back in these use step change do you walk? Um, and so that's, that, those are knobs we've always believe we're going to want. We yeah. So don't know where it's going to land yet. My, my experiments so far have found that the knob 
probably not that necessary. Most of the time, the walkbacks terminate fairly quickly. There's usually only a few names that have broad global impact, and um, and those when they get resolved, I mean, so there's a little bit of time to resolve those ones, but once they're resolved, everything else sort of comes in fairly cheaply. There could be some param on the limit, how many? Yeah, yeah, you know, that's the value. And, and, and I originally and had maybe, it like maybe that, maybe you do the full button. pass and compute everything, like yeah. you, do, you do the RP pass. So, using <laughs> this, maybe the parameter could be much, much bigger, because in that case, if you want to compute everything, you cache it as well, and then, but but we have no for the most part, it turns out as fast enough most of the time we don't have to worry about it. So, uh, again, we, we can do those things as, as, as they become an issue. Um, so, so those were the, those were the goals. Um, now I'll talk a little bit about what we actually have. Um, so the range here, there's five major components. Uh, there's the range representation, which we call high range. Originally, we created it so it just works on integers. Use wide ints. The idea was a lot of the range we but especially if we're going to have a lot of sub ranges, if we're using trees, trees convert to a wide int, then you move the operation back to a tree, and then there'd be a lot of um, churn over the tree, so we decided to need a wide int. Um, then we inherit from the base class and the one floats and create a float range. Um, anyway, we just, needed a, we just needed a base range API to work with, so we created that. Range ops is the, the heart and soul of the ranger. Um, it's basically a mechanism whereby we teach it how, for an operator like plus expression, how to find ranges on that kind of state, that expression. And uh, I'll give you an example of that in a few minutes. Uh, and the idea is that there's nothing special if you discover that if you get a range from a new tree code, um, all you have to do is write the routine for that tree code, add it in the range ops, and the entire ranger will figure ranges from it. And uh, you, you get, you only have to go and change the code in one place in order for the entire ranger subsystem to uh, understand how to deal with that tree code. Um, Gory Computes is the second piece that's extremely important. It's the part, it, the easiest way to describe what it is, GORI stands for uh, Generates Outgoing Range Information. And what it does is for any given basic block, it will look at the block and determine what SSA names ranges can be generated for, and then resolve that information within the basic block. Um, I'll go into more, little more detail about that in a minute. Uh, the on entry cache has sort of uh, self explanatory. When we calculate some ranges coming into a block, that just keeps us from excuse me, keeps us from having to recalculate it over and over. That's what slows things that would slow things down if we didn't have that. And then there's the ranger itself, which throws all these things together and gives you uh, the API that shows you five routines, and it's completely implemented using eating its own dog. So it uses it uses those same five routines to, to answer all the same questions. So you can be pretty confident that. What it's doing, what you're going to see here. Uh, um, that's class I range. There's just a just the basic operations that we do on a, on a range. It's not really that interesting. Okay. So the range ops class has. So this, this is basically dealing primarily with unary and binary operators. Those are the ones we care about most of the time. Um, fold range is what BRP currently provides. We need to We'll perform the operation between two ranges and tell you what the result is. Um, the other two routines basically will give you the answer to um, solving, the, solving the equation of uh, if you know two ranges, what's the value of the third one? So if you know what the result is and you know what the second operand is, it will tell you what the result of the first operand is. And this is how we do backwards backwards calculations, because you start at the bottom of the block, start at the bottom of the block and ask what the range is here, and when you get a result, um, you feed the result from that into the left, there's a big example there, so, you know, <coughs> job explaining this, but, uh, for 
instance, so you notice uh, if you've got, so the fold is, is sort of obvious. You get 0, 10 plus 23, you get a result. <coughs> but if you know the result and the first operand, you get to figure it knows how to uh, solve the second operand. It's just, it just falls out. It just, yeah, and that's, I'm doing pretty good on explain that. So let's, let's skip it for the moment. I'll show you. This is the complete implementation of the plus operator. Um, it, you just have to show, tell it how to uh, do a plus between two ranges, which is what uh, the uh, WI fold does. And if you And in order to solve the other operands, it's just it's just a uh, you just solve the equation that uh, if you know the left hand side and op one, then then the other operand is the left hand side minus. And you see, it uses it's 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 eating its own dog food. It just calls the operator for minus to do the subtraction. Um, have I lost everybody? I'm not doing very good job with this, but it's, no, it makes sense. no, I think I, it makes perfect sense. And that is. The entire and that's it. That's that's all you have to do to teach the ranger how to do a plus. So if you need, if you want to do a shift, you just teach it what the shift means. Well, the accumulate range is, is then interesting. How how does it deal with the overflows? And how, how so there, you'll notice, is, yeah, accumulate range. It's it's not that complicated. Uh, it does. You're passing in what the overflow values are, and that's just a shorthand version of if there's an overflow, it figures out. What the wraparound is. I still want to the code from the stuff we already have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's the same thing. Had to do it. It's the same thing. Yeah. Um, and <coughs> one of the problems that I found before was if you were trying to implement a new tree code, you had to go to the, the trace back to find all the different routines you had to touch and put a switch and put it to handle the case. I would just get lost all the time. I just, and one of the goals was to have it all localized in one place and something. Simple and easier way to do it. All these implemented feel along the way. There, you can, you can do it. So. <laughs> What's nice is, is that it is so simple, I, and I don't see us having to go back and debug plus expert ever. Yeah, there's just no need for, for the vast majority of these operators to ever have to look at this code again. And once you teach, so we we we've, we've taught it. I don't know, it's probably thirty codes, thirty different. Everything we have in everything we get before. And when I talked about sort of letting it go wild, it's when we first started debugging it, we would look at the ranges that were put out and we look at things and go, that range can't be right, so we start to debug it. And invariably, it would turn out to be right rather than <laughs> just like it finds some very strange ranges, especially if you let it have multiple sub ranges uh, when, you, when you hit it a large piece of code. It's, so that part I was very happy with. Yeah. Debugging it is not fun sometimes. And we found out that the current VRP would drop down to varying when it got confused, which was quite frequently. And then because it just had, you know, well, a range of an anti -range. Range. Yeah. ranges, it was just going to Right off the line, it would get confused and give up and say varying. And, yeah. and we went up to maybe it was four or five yeah. testing, we would find really interesting stuff. Yeah, because even if it's like, <coughs> even if you have V is equal to something plus three. It knows that the if if overflows aren't allowed, it will know that if an overflow couldn't happen, that it has to, the maximum. It's actually maximum minus three in your range, so it picks up. And when you when you put a whole bunch of instructions like that in there, you end up with end bounds that are nowhere near what you expect them to be. And the end of the old system was always very. Um, this is sort of what I mentioned before. With this is this is the uh, the part that does the that generates ranges uh, within the basic block. Um, it it takes whenever you ask for a range out of a basic block, it does a very quick check of the use depth change from the bottom back, looking at the instructions that understands and figures out which SSA names it can generate a range for, and then um, will actually calculate the range. Uh, we call this stack. I call this static because um, it's in the, in the IL. You have if A is less than five, that the 
range on the true edge will always be zero to four. That's never going to change no matter what other what other values you, you put into the chain of instructions. Uh, that's a that's a hard restriction. <coughs> There's a dynamic component which I'll talk about later. So would it be fair to say this is similar to a local property and a global propagation based algorithm? Um, or you could use, you know, yeah, no, I, I, I use you, you could stuff. say that, okay, because it's it's this is information provided that the basic block provides that um, is will, will not change. It is it is invariant. Okay, um, you can feed information into it, which may change the result. But this is this is like the raw right, information that with nothing else it's, it has to be true. For for the loops, does it use the number of Iterations analysis, or does it require the path which invokes it? So, there's a we do currently use the loop analysis in order to match what VRP does, um, and it does bring up a question. It actually can figure out a lot of loop bounds if the loop, um, if, if the loop, if the back edge says if x is if you're going from 0 to 10 and you say if x is less than 10, you're back to the top. It takes a loop by an upgrade. Uh, if you say if x is not equal to 11, which the compiler turns it into half the time, <laughs> all of a sudden, all, all we can figure out is that it's not 11. <laughs> We're so we that. don't get a root bound anymore. So <laughs> I don't know. So I was wondering if anybody actually knows why we do that. I do. We've talked about it. I know. But I mean, it could just go away. Because okay. it would be really convenient and you'd be able to pick up quite a bit more of the loop. Stuff. They can go away. The only reason we make that transformation was because it allowed us to propagate a constant on one side. Um, and if you've got, if you, if you, so we encoded it into the IL to get that propagation. Um, if we encode it into the range information, then, I, then we don't need to change the IL. So you can still see what you want to see. So that this is easy. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So we, we get a lot of loop bounds if the loops are written in a sensible way. And, and my code doesn't. Make your life harder. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Is there a way to is there a way to tell in a loop um, when you're querying the control variable? Is there a way to tell uh, whether the upper bound is a hard upper bound, whether it will actually be hit? There's a guarantee that that uh, whatever <coughs> it hits the entire range, um, as opposed to in other cases where the upper bound is just you know it, it, it can't go as high as the upper bound. But it, I don't know. I don't know. You'd have to pop through the IO and ask. It. I mean, the range information's is there, um, you should have to, I mean, I can tell you at any given point what the range of something, what the potential range is. I can't, give, I, it doesn't guarantee you that that's a range. Um, we have to be conservative in that any range that's calculated has to cover all possible ranges that it could be. Um, so if, you're, if, you're, if your variable is bumping by two, uh, we don't currently have facilities to say that, that it's always going to be evenly balanced with it. So you have like an execution you, analysis to solve the problem. Yeah, that's right, about part of my thing. I mean, you can utilize the information to help answer that question, I suspect, but we don't answer that question. Well, we have the non zero bits infrastructure. <laughs> yeah. so, yes, and there is. Future work involved, which will peg information as well. We, I've got an example at the very end that shows combining bit mass, tra bit mass tracking and all that stuff. We don't move the bit mass tracking yet, but um, it's pretty straightforward with the range op mechanism. We would add a new method to each thing that says if you're doing an operation, what bits are set, um, and you get all kinds of fascinating stuff from that too. Uh, but right now we don't do any bit mass tracking. We're just trying to create just right now. A question. Yep. Is there a possibility for a front end to tell this stuff that it knows the range? For instance, a stride in photon arrays yep. is almost always one. And we don't know how to tell the rest of the compiler. You <laughs> can easily you can write F if if some condition built in unreachable. In the code, yeah. and okay, yeah. the RP and other passes know how to deal with that. Yeah, the question is, can we do it automatically? Yeah, well, front end can do it automatically. Yeah, I guess we, I guess we have the front end insert the unreachables. Yeah. Uh -huh. Is it unreachable? Is it building expect? 
since it's mostly one, just not always. <clears throat> would you have to put the unreachable or just the built-in expect? We wouldn't do what the built-in expect. Expect is is not a hard yeah. requirement. Uh, requirement. Yeah, it's, it's the built-in unreachable says you can never get here. But if it's if mostly it's one, here. not always one. Then then you can't optimize it. Uh, well, uh, you, you can expect with probability. Case, this is probably something you can optimize. <laughs> If something, yeah, might <laughs> specialize. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But if, if you have cases where it's always like, if, yeah. and if somebody in Fortran says continuous yeah. on something, then you know it's continuous and yeah. you can assert that for the compiler. Yeah, and yeah. So if the front end can give us that, it's easy knowledge. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I'm not sure we have any of the Fortran front end guys in here that talk. <laughs> um. Okay, so this is an example of how it actually works. Um, so branches are nothing special, they're just an expression. Um, and the edge that you're taking is, is the implicit <coughs> left-hand side of, of the statement. Um, so if you're going on the true side of that, when you, when you plug, ask range ops for the less than expression, if the left-hand side is one, the right-hand <coughs> side is 100, it figures out that it's zero to ninety-nine. Same thing on the fault side. Um, so that's that's how we use the that's how we do the backwards block. Uh, we figure out at the very bottom. So you, you're asking for the range on the true edge. We figure out what the value of a three is. Then we go look at the value of a three, and we can substitute that back in. And now we can calculate a range for a six and two. So coming out of the block, we now know that we, we can calculate a range for a three, and we can calculate a range for a six. Um, and as the definite, as you walk the depth chain in the basic block, you can you can calculate a range for anything that um, any 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 sequence of statements that there is a range of entry for. So if you've got a string of five or six operations shipped in there, anything we understand, we, we can calculate a lot of different ranges coming out. So if you use B6 or one of those other um, names in a, in a basic block further on, we'll have a, we'll have calculated. And this gives us a lot more stuff than, than VRP currently does. VRP currently looks at uh, primarily just the last, the stuff feeding into that. The, <coughs> um, so we can calculate a lot of other more interesting things. Yeah, we don't have, so VRP and DOM and EVRP, none of that have a backwards propagation step. So once you figure out something you know, further down in the IL, that would imply certain ranges higher for projects higher than they're out. Yeah. We just we just don't ever find them. Um, there is some ad hoc code to, to capture those, but it is all it's strictly ad hoc based on cases we've seen. Something like this makes all that crap just go away. It, it's inherent in well the ad hoc code was mostly written for the built-in or unreachable so mm -hmm. that it can catch more interesting cases. Yeah. yeah. And and I and yeah, I the same thing with Tom. It's like all right, yeah. th there's I gotta get this one value. I need to reach this one thing to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, a lot of the code that's in there was driven by here's a case I'm trying to get. Exactly. This is designed so that we're just gonna get all the cases. We're not looking for anything specific. We just want to know what it can find. Um, and this allows it to find a lot of the <coughs> And this is why, if, um, for instance, we didn't if we didn't have um, we had an entry a new lock code to compiler. If you teach range ops what it is, then it just, when it's doing this, it'll see there's an entry for that thing, and everywhere you use it in the compiler, it'll all just, it just, it just works very nicely. Um, so, I talked about the static range being the invariant stuff that the basic block, which basic block generates. Um, in order to get more interesting results, uh, we have to look at, at what the, uh, rest of the other basic blocks are doing and how they feed into this one. So here's an example of the, the um, it's the same example we had. Uh, the ranges that are statically calculated are, are shown there. Um, but if we know coming into the block that B6 <coughs> has something else, then we can apply that as a, as a I call this the dyna dynamic asset. You simply take these static values that you can calculate inside the block and intersect it with uh, any new values you know, and you can come up with a much more accurate result. 
So in this case, we know that V6 coming into that block is uh, 31 or greater. And if you intersect that with the possible values that the block figures out, uh, you can see that we get more accurate results on the bottom. And so in this way, uh, when you keep the, uh, when, when the, when range <coughs> of this uh, dynamic query is back and it asks, when you ask for the range of A3, it will, it will see that V6 is allowed on entry to base block eight, so it will do queries asking what V6's uh, value on entry to that block is, and it will walk back until it resolves all these things. Um, As it's walking back, when does it stop there? Because it seems like so you can it, stop. it seems like I got some constant information yep. and I can stop. But if you go a little farther, like you say for B6, it will keep it going back it. until it either reaches a definition a definition it doesn't understand. Okay. So if, it, if if so from this point, like it will ask for the range of B6 at that point at the in the top block. And when it looks at the definition of B6, if that's a call, it'll say, I don't know how to resolve that. So that at this point. It's the range for the type, and, and the walk back stops at that point. Uh, most of the time, the walk back is short. Um, sometimes it's a little more complicated, but with the way the cache works, so we've done experiments um, where if you do a walk from the top of the IL, like the same way uh, BRP currently does, you do a full IL walk asset to the range of every SSH in the program. Um, as you do it from the top down, You've already answered all the questions in the cache, so that's the theory is <coughs> way to do it. Uh, we've done experiments where we went up from the bottom to the top, asking for the same thing. So when you ask for the same thing at the bottom of the program, it will have to go back and find it all in the evaluation. Um, our execution times are virtually the same. It doesn't matter what order we do it in, uh, it ends up resolving to the same amount of work for the most part. So if, if what you're asking, you only ask a couple of questions and it doesn't have to go very far, you'll get very, very fast results. If it has to check out the entire program to answer your question, it'll be the same as if you had done the walk from the top. I'm just wondering, uh, like in this specific example, in this specific like example for A3, it's several I see it's, it's between 0 yep. and 99, but as so, you say, you got this <clears throat> extra information. I mean, that seems like a hard answer. Oh, it's it's between this, but you can fine tune it by yep. looking at So, I mean, what it will do, what, as it walks back and it gets the, uh, the the if statement, it'll ask for the range of v6s at that point. v6 is a result of two things added. It will go and try to resolve those. Okay. If v6 is a call, it stops right there. Because what it's, it is a result of the email that then then it asks for what it, it asks for what the value of each argument is. So then the, the back edge. That's what the, that's what the cache handles doing back edges and um, avoid cycles. So. Currently, eBRP doesn't do any backend information at all. We get some now. It does an iterative solve when there's backend is involved. It will do an iterative solve to answer one at a time. And it has the facility, which we don't use yet, of when you discover later on that you could refine that value you calculated further, it, you can iteratively resolve, you can inject that new value and have it go back to anything. So it does. So current VRP does iterative solve for backends until it keeps looking until nothing changes. Um, so we have the ability to do that. We just do a rough first half right now. That's where I would be at. Sort of, you know, uh, compilation time. Yeah, and so far that hasn't been much of an issue uh, because when we look at the backends, it, it restricts itself to a single SSA at the time right now. So and it just solves for that one name, and that keeps us from getting <coughs> really bad feedback cycles. This thing value is fed from that, and that changed this one. I think that's where our previous LLVM had an experiment where they tried to do something like this. They gave up because um, it was just taking forever and couldn't resolve the issues. I think, I think it's because they had those kind of feedback cycles. Um, right now, we just live at that. We will experiment in the future with updating the back edges to get more accurate results. Well, in theory, for back edges, we could exploit scans. I mean, it's right so kinds of things we could be doing. But I mean, right now, even on the back edges, it does a pretty good job. Uh, and my experiments have been have shown that uh, it rarely has to do a whole lot of work. Uh, it's surprising how little work it ends up doing. 
that's the beauty of on demand. Yeah. Have you done some experiments whether if you compute it from top to down yeah, and the other way yeah. if you refine enough the same ranges? So it's, <coughs> it's it gets the exact same results in both directions <coughs> and takes about the same amount of time. No, I, I was wondering if you if you do it twice, like compute one way and, and the other way, if the other way refines enough that it's interesting. But you could have a parameter to do this ten times. Oh. Okay. Um, well, right now the, the iterative solver actually goes until it doesn't change. It actually does um, a complete evaluation for a given length of time over the back edges. Uh, so it I have seen the way the results it has computes. Sorry? It throws away the cache or no, it updates the cache and keeps refining it until it can't be refined anymore. Uh, and then it, it uses that result. Uh, I think Tone's question was, if, let's say you, you run either you know, top down or bottom up, if you were to repeat that, um, do the results typically change? I don't think so. I, I, haven't, expect to you, I, haven't, I haven't experimented with it to try it, but generally once we ask a question, <coughs> uh, I haven't tested for it, but I haven't seen any cases where I get, where if we do it a second time, we get different results. Well, and given that she tested top down, bottom up, we get the same results in place, I would not expect an, iter an iteration step to, to help here. I suspect that there are some edge cases since we don't do full, but I mean, we haven't really handled it. Uh, long term <coughs> plan was to, like I said, in inject new values into the iterative updater someday. Uh, that was going to be an experiment. The idea with this initially is we're going to replace the BRP because we have at least a good information plus more. The current BRP pass that has all of the certain expert overhead, it does full full iterative updates. So and I'm guessing you find some stuff we don't, and that was going to be sort of the next step is to try to replace both replace that as well um, with this one implementation. Uh, we haven't done that experiment yet. Uh, one one more thing. Yeah. Uh, currently we do VRP only for O2. Yeah. So if if some Passes which are run for O1 even do they use on demand this this range stuff or yeah. Yeah. there's no because reason in I mean, that case it so might be interesting to have some lower limits like we have those very ugly test cases in uh, in Bugzilla where there are millions of uh, arguments of five p nodes and, mm -hmm. and so on and it's all Brad's old cases we need to <laughs> give up <laughs> yeah there's so. One of the other things that makes this really interesting is, um, especially for like an op zero or an op one pass, you can, and in the original implementation that I wrote, it actually only go visits each base block and only looks at the last statement and says, what do I know, can, can I fold this or not? And it'll only do the minimum necessary, you don't have to walk the entire I.O. And it's, it's pretty fast and it gets all of your control flow graph. Like you can eliminate a lot of branches. Well, we get like 80 or 90 percent of what you do. Yeah, I mean, the only thing we don't get are some. There's there's some statements with a that, that they that you can end up holding that constant hold itself probably with that later. But for the most part, we get an awful lot of it just by looking at the last statement in the block and asking a question about it. Um, I've actually got a number later which shows that. Um, Um. Yeah, so as an example, um, if you're in that the basic block in the middle there and you, you see these six and one node ranges, it'll only visit the red blocks trying to calculate something. It doesn't, there's, it, 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 this, is, this is how we get um, good results, especially if you only ask a few questions, uh, because you will only go and visit the things that are actually necessary. And in particular, I think it was the sprintf pass where we fixed it up. And it only queries, um, was it the balance or? No. <coughs> it only asks for ranges and on actual print state. Right, right. So the argument for the print, it asks for that. It doesn't ask for anything else. And we get like a 95% speed up on that because it only asks a number of questions. So we <coughs> avoid all the overhead. How does it know to follow that path? as opposed to going to the right first. Because 
when you're asking for um, the range of B6 here, it, has a little, it only looks in print. So let's say, what's the range coming in on this for B6? It goes back to this block, says, well, B6 is live on entry to this block. So that predecessor, and then it looks at that predecessor, now it's finding the definition and stuff. Uh, but I mean, how did, why did it pick, why did it start with the, well, that definition? Because this, this is where, this is where I am in the program when I'm doing my analysis. And it, this is just an example. Of, I see. You this, don't have to I happen to want to know what it is. Maybe yeah. this is the case where it's used in a printf, and my printf thing says, what's the range of B6 here? This might be something else. So this might be the only one we care about, and if that's the only one we care about, that's all the work we do. Got it. Actually, couldn't you have useful information coming from the blue, like that blue, if you had some type of test that said B6 is unreachable on this value range. But if it's unreachable, so, if it's unreachable over here, that's not going to affect the range in this block. Well, I mean, it's like I know B6 is... It, I'm as a user, I'm putting something in yeah. as it can't well, be less than this. If, I, I'm making if it's a statement from here, you'd have to be able to find it. Yeah. Like it's, in the, it's either in the definition of it or something that feeds the definition of it. Uh, I mean, well, I mean, it could, it could, it could be like B6 is coming some from function value. And I'm saying yeah. it's a statement. I know well, it's not going to be 20 it's or it's not if you said that in the statement, that statement's going to be in the IL. That statement has to be in the IL and it has to, I mean, it has to be before the... But it's the, not yeah. an external thing that says, oh, magically this thing got constrained. Yeah, but maybe I'm a dumb user and I only put it on the one path or something like that over there. I don't know. It'll only, well, it's, yeah. it'll only take effect on that path. <laughs> <laughs> if, so if, the only thing that's if voting it's true, on the path is, is the built-in unreachable call. But right, you be careful. Well, about but if you put your built-in on, if you've got an if up here somewhere and unreachable on one side, yeah. then I will get to that if eventually, and that information sure. will propagate it down. Okay. I mean, if if the key is that it has to be any information um, that affects the range, by definition, has to um, has to dominate the block that I'm in. Like, if it doesn't dominate the block I'm in, it doesn't affect my block. Mm -hmm. Do you do anything for pointers and other builders? Yeah. Pointers? We track pointers exactly like, yeah. Yeah, but they're referencing pointer and things that they're not built. Yep. So pointers, there's a slightly extra few <coughs> references that you don't get that from. Uh, we actually have, it actually walks, when you ask for a pointer, it'll do a quick walk of um, use that chain to find out where that pointer is. Or sorry, not use that chain, but it look it has a quick walk of all of the uses. Mm -hmm. um, checks which, it says a bit for which basic blocks is being referenced in. So we have a quick block summary knowing which basic blocks there's a non null in, and then we can propagate that information. Okay. And if you ask in a block where it was not non null coming in and it was non null then we have to do another block. So this is one case we're going backwards to copy the flash. You there's ways around it and it works real fast for <coughs> this. When you do the on-demand stuff, do you, do you need it with, with the global ranges as well? Yes. Nice. At all points, whatever your global range is, that's part of the dynamic component. Anytime you've calculated something, it's always intersected with whatever global is. Uh, which. Uh, is it an Intel Pro schedule? Sorry? Uh, is it your, I mean, Intel Pro schedule. Function call, checking function call, and any other stuff. Uh, so, right now we don't do anything. Um, if if you add a hook into it somewhere, <coughs> if V6 is defined by a function call, if we have some way of querying that function saying what range is coming at, uh, we can propagate that information. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, or you can almost, for example, con conceptually have an attribute of a function that says, here are the algorithm ranges it generates. And if, if we somehow tag or attach that information to the call, and we write the the operator for it, it would fall out. For for, for built-ins, we already have something like that. What for that like, yeah. case? And, and what happens is that actually the global ranges all has the same names that are parameters, not the return values that we don't say. So the parameters you get the global they are known. You get the global ranges from the call. Okay. And so we could add the, the return values as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, I mean, if, I mean, so if at some point, if this was a call, if this was a parameter on a call, um, we could also wire in whatever this range is to um, the, 
that particular call instance, you'd be able to. Uh, well, for for parameters, it would be in the global range anyway. Yeah. 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 Well, this what you may have something that's not global here. You may have something more refined that you could use for this particular call. If you have a call where there is an object that has a context sensitive range yeah. attached to it. Yeah. So I mean, there's there's certainly extra information we can do there. That, so we can do better than we could do at individual call sites. We can do better with. Uh, but yeah, what, what I wanted to say, about uh, how the interprocedural thing comes in, for parameters, the global ranges come from the call, and if you intersect with that, you already get that information. We haven't really looked at the interprocedural stuff. Yeah, much. We're, just, we're just trying to get it in. Our yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the worry that I have with the interprocedural side of this would be uh, compile time complexity. And, and Dealing with the fact that, that at a call site you could have a context sensitive range, does that explode the amount of analysis we have to do or explode the amount of cloning we have to do? We just have to look at We don't do any cloning based on value ranges. How okay. to do, yeah, and, and, and doing that would mean uh, rewiring the predicates that, uh, you know, that, that decide what is beneficial and what, what is not. We're a dot of constants and that plus on value ranges. And then, of course, we have to limit how many value ranges. Are Exactly. But, but, for but the, it for should be that, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of work, but it should be, it should be possible. Yeah, for so the, for the cloning on the value ranges, we probably would have to have also information on how likely. Yeah, it, it, it starts, it, it, so that starts to get complex. And, and yeah. the question is, is it worth it? And, and so I think. So for non newness I think it is. Yeah, and that, and that may be the, the case <laughs> that you go, yeah, that was worth doing. <laughs> And I, I think, you know, once we, we get to the point where we can integrate this, talking to you about, you know, what do we want to do from an interprocedural standpoint, I, I think that would be a great time to start talking Anybody about Anybody that has a request, send it to me now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what do you do for the modulo operator? Because that's one place we see in spec where a value range based on modulo would be useful, right? Um, do you do anything with that? Um, we do, we have, we, we, we have a, we have modulo implemented, I think. Um, yeah, we do the same thing now. So, I mean, we will know if it's if if it's modulo a constant. You'll know that it's between zero and a constant minus one. Yeah, because if that could be fed into the cloning information, we know that that's a valuable oh. thing for a particular. Uh, <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. No, I mean uh, it's like to do solvers. Yeah, so I mean if if that's fed into it, we we will give you an accurate range for that. Yeah, so yeah it's currently on that. So. Yeah. So that, that, that so that's an example of where. This looks good to me. So, thank you. I'm running more times when it's into a couple things here. Um, this is just an example of how easy it is to use. This this is the actual code you changed in the uh, create up pass. We just we just create a global ranger and ask for the range of the expression, and it gives us back a value and it's going to remind you what. So you can't get much easier to use than that. Um, what about logical ranges? Sorry. What about logical ranges? So. Bit fields or what well, bit masks? We have a way of expressing those. So bit masks, that. we're not expressing those yet. We plan to, uh, but at the moment we're not. At the moment we're just we're getting the ranges done, and then the bit masks will be implemented and and mapped into it, and then we'll, we'll be able to track both some of things. We have plans to. We just have to so you could you could express as a range as being a combination of both of them. Right. I, I, I like I like to have endpoints, and we can also say yeah. we, we know this bit is zero all the time, and this bit is one all the time. Yeah. Uh, stuff like that. Well, right now it's done in a separate pass, yeah. and so eventually we want to do it in the same thing. Yeah. In the same thing. In the idea is we should track it simultaneously and keep both pieces of information without complicating the code. It will. That they should both be able to coexist in this. Well, right now we have some automatic conversions from, from the yep. ranges to the bit masks and back. Um, Somehow, so right? Anyway, so, <laughs> explanation details. Do you need to enumerate every single expression now and say defaults to varying, or is it no that if there's no definition yet? That well, no, well, very. it's guaranteed. So when you ask a question, it does a lock back. But no, I'm talking about the implementation. I'm talking about the implementation yeah. in the actual right. You see, you need to have in this class all different. Here's where to add a new expression. If the expression doesn't exist yet, yeah. does the implementation default to vary, or do I need to actually? Oh, yeah, it will be right now. It defaults to vary, but do I need to have an explicit case. Nope. Okay. 
He says, so, so, so there's nothing when you, you, exactly. When you range ops, when you do plus, you enter into the table for plus expert. Um, the way the mechanism works is that whenever it sees a statement, it looks at the expression and says, do I have an entry in range ops table for it? If it does, then I get value from it. If it doesn't, it's fair. Okay. Um, <coughs> do you use <laughs> undefined type? Sorry? Or do you use the undefined type? For initial odds. No. Um, so, we'll, so it's very our undefined means something different than VRP's undefined. Undefined in VRP means we haven't looked, we don't know what it is yet, we haven't looked at it. In our case, um, since we default the varying for stuff, undefined means interestingly that this this expression isn't actually reachable. It's like dead code. If you get an undefined back from the ranger, it means that, that piece of code. Um, like if you say if, uh, if A is greater than 30 and then over here, you know it's greater than 30 and the next thing says if A is less than 20, anything on that block on the, on the true side of that is going to be undefined because it can't be both less than 20 and greater than 30. And in this case, it doesn't make sense to optimize it because it will be able to. Right, well, you know, we, we, I mean, we make it viral so that you could actually, you could actually do difficult information with the range just by asking, is the range undefined? Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on, on the time. We're, we're, we're pretty comparable. There's an issue with the way switches are implemented in, uh, in GCC that causes us to slow down the switches. Uh, I don't have the time to go into the details on why they're bad. So there's no, there's, there's, it's, it's effectively, um, in order to calculate the range properly on a switch case right now, it's like a total of amplitude. Based on the number of switches, edges. so it's very helpful. So we have hacks around it. I think eventually I'm just going to replace the change the way switches are. Yeah, it's a representational. Problem. It's a representational problem. But because this kind of query has never been asked before, so it wasn't designed. Um, suffice to say, we'll read that. Okay, so here's an example. We converted these three classes. Um, the W printf one <coughs> is very fast because it's currently it was, it's currently wired into EBRP, so it, it has to go and do a, it builds dominator, does a dominator lock, has to build all the ranges for everything, but it only actually queries a few things here and there. So by switching to our model, we don't build the dominator here. We don't have to lock the entire IL. Uh, WLK is slightly slower because the existing pass uh, only uses local information. And we changed it so it's using contextual information, so we're actually calculating a lot more information and virtually we're catching a lot different stuff. Uh, catch a lot of stuff with it. Um, we're currently trying to get both range ops and glory computes into the pilot for the stage one right now. Uh, I think range ops is imminent. Jeff's trapped. We, we, we're pretty it. sure we're in the middle. Yeah. We're either in the middle of doing a fedora or we're here to, to ensure that we're. Oh, okay. Right. Right. Okay, it's all seen. Okay, it's all seen. Right. So, so <laughs> the plan is to have those those two components in by the end of stage one. The rest of it uh, we'll have to do in the next stage because we're, we're too late in the cycle to try to get all of it in. Uh, so we're we're switching from irony and we're using the existing value range. Uh, we 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 took the existing range class and we unified it with our class so that the APIs are identical. So we actually run, we actually have a play in our branch where we can run the ranger completely with either implementation of, uh, of ranges. Um, and verify that it's And verify that we get the same results and everything works. So, so, so you don't you don't plan for this 10 the passes you've converted already? Um, no, because we, we won't be able to do that because we're not going to get the entire ranger. Like the on-demand mechanism, we're not going to get in for the portion. Um, although anybody that's interested in experimenting with it, we're going to have a branch available that we can play with. So to touch very briefly on the <coughs> testing aspect, um, we took it when you you have that the test to verify we're getting the same ranges from both. And we ran that through all 8,700 Fedora binary packages to verify we're getting the same ranges. Um, this has been yeah, we, we thoroughly tested. Yeah. 
and we're going to do another one next week, just before we check in. So did that, I'm not sure I heard the question right. Are you saying that you're not the converted passes? Are not no, because they require the on-demand ranger fund. And with the on-demand part's not going to be good. Um, so the Gory computes will get in and we're going to convert EVRP to use it so it will get more ranges than it gets now. Uh, this will, will be more than just the last statement of the block that you know, the ranges for. Um, but it'll get, so at least we'll get that stuff in and we'll be relatively confident. The basis is in what's working in our branch will be easy to maintain, mm -hmm. hopefully. And then we should be ready to go next day. Uh, by then, we'll we'll replace both of them. But VRP, like the, no, no EVRP, will keep a certain experts purchased. VRP is going to keep a certain expert. Yeah. We're hoping to kill the link between EVRP and a certain expert. Because right now, EVRP calls into VRP to build an assert expert. Takes the information out of it and throws it the thing, throws it away, and keeps that range information. So we <coughs> replace that mechanism with the Gory Computes range counter. So taking out a cert expert is more of a GCC 11 thing. Yeah. Hopefully that'd be a dead thing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and they're actually very expensive. Yes, they are. <laughs> uh, so the only as is the propagation step, mm -hmm. the only VRP is just painful. So this 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 mentions the bitmap tracking, bit mass tracking, which we mentioned that's one of the things that it doesn't do now. We plan to add. Um, we also don't do equivalences and relations, which the current VRPs do. Uh, we plan to add that as a separate independent thing as well. That's basically, in this case, if you're just looking at ranges and you don't know anything about the range of A2 and B3, you can't answer that question because, you know, A2 is varying, B3 is varying, varying, less than varying, we don't know the answer to that. You have to actually know that there's a relation between A2 and B3 and we don't track it. VRP currently does it by adding symbolics into the ranges. Um, we, we, I have plans for a better way of doing it, so we don't have to mess up the ranges. Um, and then the very final thing is this is this was an example of if we combine all those things and you're tracking the bits and you're tracking relations, um, I I plan to be able to fold that different way and know that if you uh, it's sort of showing at the top there, you the P4, you know what the range of that is, and you feed that in the definition of X2, and you track your bits and stuff. By the time you get to that if, you should be able to answer that question. You know that if it was true. It gives me a headache. Backwards, <laughs> <laughs> so that's okay. 